Good evening, Sierra. Hello. How are you? Very good. How are you? <laughs> yeah, I'm really, really well. Thank you. It's fantastic to be here with you this evening. And I'd just like to take a moment to introduce you to all of our viewers. I know that we're going to have a lot of really keen uh, teachers and parents, uh, both from uh, New Zealand and Australia and quite possibly further afield. So uh, for all of you watching this evening with us in our chit chat, it's my uh, absolute pleasure to welcome Sarah Assome, uh, who is the Assistant Principal at Bentley West Primary School in Victoria. And Sarah is also a dyslexia specialist. She has been, <clears throat> excuse me, it's no wonder my voice is a little bit croaky this week. <laughs> she has been instrumental in leading the change at Bentley West Primary School, but also supporting many colleagues, both state and um, nationwide. And here you are this evening uh, supporting us internationally. So I just want to say a huge uh, thank you, Sarah, for giving up your family time this evening to, to come in and have a chit chat with me to spread the good word about just really the story of how Bentley West has gone from perhaps, you know, maybe not being so evidence-based to mm -hmm. completely evidence-based. And, and I'm really going to celebrate and say really leading the charge um, internationally. There's no doubt about that. So congratulations on all that you have achieved. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Fantastic. So, Sarah, shall we begin our chat this evening by talking, maybe you'd like to just share a little bit of the history of the journey for Bentley West. How did you recognise there was a need perhaps to look into and review your instruction? Yeah, look, I came from, I've taught in Singapore for a while, before that I was in the UK, so had been exposed to explicit phonics, obviously teaching in the UK was that was that was what just what we did. Um, following that, I was working in Singapore and in learning support. So we were routinely screening our three and four year olds for phonemic awareness in Singapore, and I was a learning support teacher, and then giving intervention. So when I moved to Australia and I had my first daughter and she started prep and was struggling with reading, I kind of started looking for answers and going, "Oh, what's going on here? It's not really working for her. She wasn't at our school; she was elsewhere, and she wasn't getting it. She wasn't picking up the sight words. She was um, having issues with self-esteem." Um, and I started looking at the intervention that we were giving. Um, at that point, I was doing two and a half days as literacy support, just with prep um, and trying to pick up the kids in prep that needed that intervention. And I just started doing what I thought was routine practice, I guess, at screening their phonemic awareness. And the teachers are thinking, well, what are you doing? And what's that telling you? And so I just started doing what, what I knew best. I then searched for some more answers and did some additional training. So I did the MSL training at that stage. I'd already previously done quite a few dyslexia courses via the UK. And then since then, I've done also the Dyslexia Action and the OG course and the letters training twice. Um, so I've done the online and the face-to-face. -face. So I've kind of covered you know, most of those, sat the exam in the States for structured literacy. Um, so yeah, I started really searching those answers, I guess, for her and to go, well, wh why, why is she not getting it? What are we doing that's mm. not quite right? So I started looking at the intervention and I obviously changed the intervention to to be more evidence-based. But then we started going, okay, they're getting that in, in support. So our, our response to intervention, the tier threes and the tier twos were getting really good support in prep only at that point. Um, but what was happening is the classroom wasn't matching. Um, so they, it wasn't whole school at all at that stage. That was back in 2013, 14. Um, it then we took, a, we took, we've taken five years, I guess, to, so the kids who now currently are in grade five have had that instruction since the beginning. Um, whereas my daughter's now in year seven so she's been through the model but she wasn't didn't Bentley West didn't have it from the beginning at that stage yeah, it certainly yeah. took some consistent time to get there um, and to get it right and we've still got things to do um, we're nowhere near finished <laughs> um, but it, it, it took time so I guess I started looking for that training looking for those answers and we started implementing it in at that point I was also job sharing a prep class so I was doing intervention but then sharing a class as well so we started looking and that was about when Stephen Cap came um, at that point, we had reading recovery prior to that. She'd retired. So Steve kind of said, well, what, you know, what's going on? What's, what's the intervention you're using? What do you need to put in place? And he said, okay, you guys in the prep team, follow what Sarah and her, I was sharing with another, another Sarah at the time, follow what they're doing. Mm. Put that into place for the whole of the preps and let's, you know, let's follow that model because the results were showing that, that these kids were, were making far greater progress. So we really started, I guess, bottom down at the preps and said, right, let's change the instruction 
and let's start looking at that but quickly realized that we had a lot to do with teacher knowledge teacher pedagogy yeah it wasn't just a quick fix of okay let's let's change this buy this program put it in place and it was <laughs> gonna be fine if only it was that easy yeah so true so so really what you're saying in terms of where you began you you did you had that personal element and yeah in, I certainly very did. early uh, yeah, days both my eldest and my youngest have had had their struggles along the way yeah. um so yeah they definitely and, and my brother to be honest back you know, way back when in the UK struggled as well mm. um, so yeah we've got certainly and I'd had a lot of experience with dealing with students with dyslexia and learning difficulties and various difficulties in Singapore my first job was in a language unit in the UK you know just when I'd graduated with non-verbal students I've had a lot of experience with children with additional needs mm. um, so I, I kind of always look for that evidence and look for the the best practice for those guys and you know if I can't find yeah. the answer I'll keep looking for the answer <laughs> Yeah, that's great. And, and, and so then you, you, you took the ball by the horns, and yep. you were working in intervention, and you were looking into, um, you know, what is going on. And, and so what your journey at Bentley West has been is that you began an intervention, and then you started at prep, and then you've yep filtered it through yeah so what we quickly realized was that okay let's get the prep team trained up give them some knowledge of msl og training so we mm. okay let's let's get those but then we kind of went okay let's slowly have one person in each year level trained to lead the charge right because it was all very well having you know and then we realized that was about when steve came and he said well actually i need the training if i'm going to lead this i need to know exactly what so steve has done both the msl and the og training um, he needed to have the leadership needed to have that knowledge and obviously I'm now there as assistant principal with Steve so the leadership mm. have and actually now everybody has that training um, but we also realized that we needed that whole school consistent instructional model which yes. we also didn't have there was too many different spelling programs be it they all might have been evidence-based or good but there was too many there was no consistent language use mm. so you'd have one teacher calling it a bossy -y, one teacher calling it silent -y, one teacher calling it magic -y, one teacher calling it split our diagraph and the poor kids had no idea because they mm. think there were all different spelling rules so we really needed to get the consistent language the consistent model of teaching you know even down to the layout of the classrooms is pretty consistent now at our school and it's pretty laid out as this is what we expect down to the routines you know and if it's not if it's not being achieved put a routine around it is what we say getting yeah. that response to intervention model I guess really really rigorously in place not just for learning difficulties but for behavior for mm. attendance so I can tell you know we can tell you who the, the, the kids at tier three for behavior are the kids at tier three at risk for attendance so it's really yeah. getting rigorous processes in place for everything not just the knowledge so I guess there's two arms there was the uh, instructional model and then there was your knowledge mm. and we we weren't great at either at that point because we didn't have that consistent instructional model and we didn't the teachers didn't have the knowledge of systematic mm. phonics, morphology, structured literacy, vocabulary, grammar, it was everything. So not mm. just phonics, it was all of them. And they yeah. just didn't have that knowledge. I, I think too, some of the things that you've you've mentioned, like when you said about, you know, or some you know, we've got a multitude of spelling programs or spelling yeah. assessments. So currently we we experience that a lot here in New Zealand, you know, and that's actually our first port of call is let's have a have a look at the lay of the land across a particular school. Um, and building that consistent practice is absolutely what we're experiencing is really, really shifting students forward. And like you say, the, the commonality of the language. And when I listened to Steve speak, as mm. we were just talking about before we came on at the LDA um, webinar the other night, he talked about the teacher content knowledge. He talked about the three parts, the teacher content knowledge, the instructional practice, but then also the leadership. You know, I think that we're, um, and, and I know that you uh, will agree with this, is that we're, you, you can't move forward if you just have the content knowledge or the instructional practice in isolation or even together. We need the direction and support and guidance from leadership. That's exactly right. And quite a lot of the schools that we've had visit over the last couple of years, we will say to the teachers, that's great. If you want to come and visit, please do, but please bring your leadership with you. Mm. Because it's all very well, they'll go back and explain what they want to do and what changes they want to make. But if the leadership's not on board, it's not going to happen financially for various reasons, but you also have a time release, or they'll come back and then do another visit and another visit, and it takes up, you know, a lot of everyone's time and you, and the change might mm. not happen. Um, yeah. without that. And I certainly was in that position, you know, I was, prior to Steve coming, there was lots of things I was trying to change and it just wasn't happening quick enough and wasn't happening 
fast enough. Mm. Um, and it was only really when Steve started doing a lot of the reading and that he would actually, you're right, let's try this, let's do this and let's let's move forward and make these changes. But yeah, and, you definitely need that leadership support. Yeah, and I think that was one thing too. And, and for those people who are listening, I will link in the YouTube clip and I know Sarah's got one of these webinar presentations, which will come to shortly. But um, I, I think for those leaders in New Zealand and Australia who are listening to us, um, live or in, in a replay series, you know, I think one of the things that I really respected about Steve's presentation was that he openly shared that he didn't have that knowledge in the first yeah. instance, and that he was potentially not a believer and he was really unsure about, but once he really looked into the evidence, yeah. you know, it was completely black and white for him. And I, and I, I really respected that. I respected his ability to actually, one, be able to, to, to openly share that. And that's my own experience as a school leader too. Um, but I think I, that's, it's just so crucial in making the change. Exactly right. I mean, I certainly didn't have the knowledge and you look back at the kids I taught even in Singapore or prior to that and you go, I wish I knew what I know yeah. now. Nobody goes into teaching to do a bad job. I don't know any teacher that doesn't yeah. do that for their kids, but you don't know if you haven't. Mm. And again, teachers don't tend to have the time or knowledge or where to source the research from and mm. to read through those, you know, the various research documents. They'll do what the school's doing or they'll do what they taught, would learn at another school or a placement or, mm. you know, they don't have that knowledge of evidence. Yeah. So at Bentley West, you've then been on this journey for around seven years. Is that correct? Yeah, probably explicitly for five, I'd say. So probably with, with in seven in support, but really whole school, I would say it's the five year journey. So our grade fives this year were the cohort that had it all the way through. So we were quite gutted when that plan was canceled, which would be probably be the only school yeah. we that were, because we were looking forward to our growth in grade three to five, because those were the cohort we've been tracking all the way through. Mm. Um, we've got other data to see where they're sitting, but yeah, those are the guys that have had everything laid out in front of them. So we'd start in prep. Those are the guys that have had spelling mastery laid out in front of them as the, probably one of the few programs we do pull on yeah. uh, as a orthographic support um, just to work on the orthographic mapping but again it's not the only thing we don't have one program let's take that program it's going to work for everyone mm. um, but these are the guys that we've had evidence-based all the way through they've had the explicit morphology the structured morphology all the way through as well yeah um, and the intervention since prep so mm. they've had that all the way through and, and it's interesting to hear you say that because often in the schools that we're working in, we talk about how we're going to not really reap the reward of this until we no. get this kind of sweep through and it will be three to five years. And I, I, right. I, I don't know what you have experienced in leading your team, but I often experience that that's quite a hard pill for people to swallow because we, we see the need so instantly and we want that quick fix. And it's really hard because I was exactly like that. You want to change it all straight away, get it all fixed. And, you know, you can't wait, especially when you've got those poor kids in grade five, six, and you want to help fix mm, them. And yeah. I, I do remember having a conversation with Steve about this. And he said, but if you put all your energy in the, in the kids in the older grades and you don't hammer those younger kids, we're going to have the same issue. We're still going to have that big gap and we'll get to the older grades because we haven't given the intervention early enough. And we know that kids need to be reach grade level by grade three or there's a 75% chance they won't ever get there. So we know we've got to hammer those early intervention, the early identification, early intervention. I mean, that was one of Tanya Forbes crying. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. We've got to get in early and we've got to identify early and intervene really early. Mm. So let's just capture that wee quote again, because that was pure gold. Can yeah. you remember it? Or shall I? The Tanya, or, Tanya Forbes one, it was early. Her, her cry is early, early, early. Yeah, um, but, you, but yeah. you also said about we've got to get them by grade three. Yeah, so we've got to get them by grade three because there's a, if they don't get to grade level by grade three, there's a 75% chance they won't actually reach that level, mm. which is quite horrifying when you look at how many kids don't get identified until grade five, year seven, even high school for some people. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, we can't do that. It's just not not good enough. We can, you know, we know at three or four or five years old that there's flags. We don't need to label and diagnose them with a psychologist. We have to do yeah, it so true. We can identify them really early, and we need to be doing that. Mm, yeah. So um, for those people who are watching, and just for those people who are, are watching live with us now, I would really like to encourage you at this point to pop any questions that you've got into the comment thread. I'm just sort of going to track the comments beside me, uh, or sorry, your questions, and I'm really happy to ask Sarah any questions that uh, you have on your behalf. So if you just pop into the comment thread and throw any questions you have in there. One thing I just want to go back to, Sarah, and pick up on is that you're a qualaholic. So you, you are a qualification or a trainer-holic. And did you notice how I just did that, qualaholic? <laughs> I liked it, yeah. 
So you're what I call a qualaholic and you have such extensive knowledge. And, you know, I think that's one thing that uh, in New Zealand, and I was this person myself, I was what the Minister of Education called a P addict. So I was a program addict as a school principal. <laughs> and she came to our school one day and she said, you know, when we were sharing the change in our pedagogy and she said, wow, you've really shifted from being a P addict. And I thought, well, that, that's pretty. That's a pretty out there thing to say. <laughs> but it was, but it was really granted. And I think one of the things that um, that I've really gleaned from the time that I've had speaking with you this evening and prior is that, you know, you really are an advocate, and and so is the leadership team at Bentley West for building pedagogy over clutching to programs. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. And that's the thing. I mean, we can't take a child and fit them to a program because they've all got different needs and different profiles. And, you know, it's got to be tailored to such. And it's that's where you, we have got to bring in those, you know, the outside therapists or whoever's working with us, an OT, a speechy or an all be on the team approach. So, you know, so that those poor parents are spending money on therapists that we're all on the same goals, the same ILP goals, you know, because we can't, we don't have all the answers and we've got to find them and we've all got to pull together, but it won't be that. And if it's not, if they're not moving, it's clearly not working for them. So, you know, if they're not making progress and it's not working, um, um, and that's why that data tracking is so important with the diables tracking and things like that, because we've got to be making sure that they're making gains, because otherwise we've got to change what we're doing. Um, yeah. So we've got to change whatever it is that we are doing and to, to make sure they make the progress. Mm. So one of the questions that is, is cropping up a lot for us currently across New Zealand, and that I'm going to say it's probably around, oh, I'm going to just kind of have a wee stab in the dark here, but between... Um, Liz Kane Literacy and Learning Matters it's probably around I don't know 60 schools it might be 60 to 70 to 80 schools that are really really truly beginning to be entrenched in structured literacy awesome. and building pedagogy yeah. so uh, one of our challenges has been where we have historically measured progress based on our reading levels Yep. And that was one thing that I really wanted to touch on with you to, you know, obviously you have NAPLAN as your sort of standardized assessment. So we don't have a standardized assessment in yep. New Zealand. And lo and behold, people will probably fall off their chair when I'm going to say, well, actually, you know, I kind of sit and say, well, I think that would be quite a good thing because um, maybe it would um, uh, take the Band-Aid off and, you know, rip, rip, the, rip the scab off the saw, so mm. to speak, to expose what's truly going on. Yeah. Um, but anyway, that aside, um, so what we're looking at is we're looking at, you know, we're measuring progress through um, monitoring gains in phonological and phonemic awareness. We're measuring progress in through um, the progress through a scope and sequence um, for measuring the code. We can look into fluency rates and see um, how fluency rates are increasing um, in terms of um, being relative to the scope and sequence. Yeah. But, but where we look to our national benchmarks at the moment, I'm just going to say the, the challenge is, is that we feel like we're in this place of we can't measure against that reading level because that re those books aren't leveled. Now that we know what we know, they're not leveled. And, and so we f we're sort of feeling a little bit, I'm going to say, ripped off. Yeah, and I, and I guess, I mean, that's certainly the journey we've been through with, we used to, you know, they were level this and that was where they are on reports and that means they're at standard or ahead of standard. Yeah. Or, and teachers really grappled with that when we first moved to this approach. So we didn't rip anything out until we had something that was kind of a Bentley was, I guess, a bit of our leadership motto. We wouldn't take it anything away until we had something to replace it with. So we didn't take away things like our running records until we had a really solid assessment to put in its place um, because teachers would, would be going, well, how am I assessing if you haven't got anything there? And as much as it was probably a year or so on when I wanted to take it away, but it took us a time to get there um, because, again, teachers need that, that data and that assessment. So I guess, again, we looked at it from all the way down in prep and all the way up. So we looked at the assessments we were using. Were they assessing what we needed to know? So were they assessing based on the evidence of what we're teaching. So was it assessing and telling us, and it actually got to a point where the teachers would go to knock on Steve's door and they say, look, we don't want to be doing our running rate. It's not telling us, it's telling us a level. It's not telling me the information as the way we teach. It's not telling me if they've got issues with fluency or, mm. or issues with comprehension or issues with language comprehension. So when teachers had the knowledge, they knew more about listening comprehension, decoding. And I'd say to the staff, okay, well, where is their difficulty? Is it in decoding? Is it in language? Is it in listening comprehension? 
you know, where is their, pin, let's pinpoint their difficulty. And, you know, if they couldn't tell me, we'd go, okay, let's go and do some more further assessments to go, okay, where is that difficulty? Because mm. you know, we went from a before, it's, let's just refer them to support and support will pick up all these kids. <laughs> but that was growing as opposed to shrinking. So we knew we were on the wrong track with that. So we did, we, I guess we looked at those assessments and started right back down in foundation in prep where we would screen those students before they start. So, mm. for example, the kids coming in next January, end of January, February, will be screened in October this year. So we bring them in the year before to do so, to what we use, the feeler, which is Ros Nielsen's assessment. She's yeah. written the slap R. So we use her assessment. She also has the C part, which is also a great one. Um, we use that with them before they even start school, along with some maths assessments and gross and fine motor and other things that we, we have a look at. Um, but we start that beforehand. And again, that's not to label or diagnose, but it's to red flag anyone who might need some intervention. So we can give that intervention ASAP as soon as they you know start in foundation. And then I guess we slowly replaced a lot of the other assessments. We use the Dibbles across the school, which is measuring three times a year. And that's looking at, um, it's looking at their, in the early years, it's got a lot of phonological, but as you get to the older years, it's got some measures of comprehension and some measures of fluency. Um, so we can really see what's happening there. And again, we've got various assessments we'll pull on for those tier two or tier three students. Mm -hmm. So if they're in intervention, we would use things like the SPAT R or the TILS or the motive assessments. So there's a, there's a variety and the phonic screening check is for all as well. Mm -hmm. So that's all the grade ones. So, and then we do, we do measure with PAT R. So without NAPLAN, we can measure their growth each year, year on year with PAT reading um, and PAT spelling. So we can look at that across the school and grammar and punctuation and so grammar and punctuation is one of the probably the first things that grew interestingly enough wow. um, because that was the first thing we worked with Bev Dorianka quite a few years ago on developing grammar knowledge and the teachers so the teachers had the knowledge and you say well what's changed well we're teaching it really explicitly yes. and the teachers, because they didn't the teachers didn't know the spelling rules the grammar they didn't mm. understand it and they didn't weren't able to explicitly teach it um, so I guess the, as the pedagogy and the teacher knowledge changed the assessments had to change yes yeah, sure. it just wasn't matching up it wasn't yeah. telling them what they needed to know about the kids. Mm. But I really um, kind of like, although, because I'm probably a wee bit impatient too, and I and I, and I I feel this real, um, you know, I have a, a bit of a bugbear. I'm going to say I just have a bugbear with predictive texts and, you know, and, and where they lead and what they don't do for our brains when we're, ch well, for those children's brains, we, you know, we know so much more. But, but, you know, from a school leadership perspective to hear you say, you know, don't throw those things out, keep them there until you've got something that's really great and evidence based and uh, to replace it with. So, and probably the one thing we yeah. have done is we've kept a lot of the nonfiction predictables. Right. So kids are fluently reading in mm. grade three. The nonfiction can give those kids some of the background, the higher level nonfiction mm. can give them the background knowledge, the vocab that they need as, you know, home readers where they're read to them. Or, and it's getting away from they have to be able to read mm. it read to them to give them because really once they're decoding it's that background knowledge and, and, yeah. and vocab that they really need to hammer in those older grades and that's our big focus now is that background knowledge vocab mm. um, in the older grades to get that growth from those because they can decode it's just you know that's what holds them back yeah yeah so I'm about baseball I know nothing about baseball I'm not going to be stuck or cricket or you know it's <laughs> I'm not, not going to be able to give you the answers um Okay, I've got a few a few questions here. Uh, when it takes so long to set um, school-wide systems in place and the focus is on primary education, you know, this question is about hope for children moving on to middle school or secondary school um, if they haven't had systematic structured literacy instruction or they haven't mm -hmm. been what we call in New Zealand an osmosis learner. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so what are you observing that's happening in um, the secondary schooling system and potentially in Victoria that's really making a difference? Yeah, look, I think, and again, that's why I kind of hate that stat of when you get to grade, you know, if you're not at level by grade three, well, of course, we're not going to give up on those kids in the older grades. So never, we're always going to give them the intervention and support they need. It's never too late to give up on students. I'll make that quite clear. Um, but beyond grade three and up, and certainly in that secondary level, it's bringing in that technological support. So bringing in that the Microsoft 365 tools and that speech to text. And I've spent some quite a bit of time today with some grade sixes at school, to be honest, really trying to upskill them in using mm. that next year, because that's, that's going to be the key to them. And often these kids are extremely verbal. Um, and it's pretty really bright kids and it's so frustrating that they can't get it down on the page and come year seven when they're expected to write essays um, I guess the other big thing I think is and parents sometimes are unaware or teachers are, might be unaware is the big working memory component or that executive function difficulty of when you get into a secondary school and you've got to organize all those different yeah. files know which ones to come for this subject and try and access that online and open your textbook online and then you can't read the textbook so you can't ask the question and you're tested and the time's testing and it's really pushing those kids to advocate for themselves so that's certainly mm. what I'm 
daughter and getting them to email the teacher, okay, I need more time for this test or I need mm. the questions read for this test or really getting them to advocate for themselves because they, they can't, yeah. it's, it's hard in secondary with different teachers and trying to communicate with, with them. Mm. All. That's challenge. so true. And um, in, in my own experience supporting my own son, I built a student profile which actually um, had information about how we advocate for, then we move to advocate with and then self-advocacy. Because there's a process, isn't there? We can't just expect that all of a sudden, because they transition to secondary school, they can all of a sudden miraculously advocate for themselves. They can't that's do right, that. That's right. And, you know, it's in a, a new bigger school and it's it's harder. And, yeah, we've done, I've done a lot of that. I've lot of, written a lot of profiles for our grade sixes to the schools that want them. Um, so the schools that are happy to have those, I've written the profiles for them in conjunction with the kids so that they've mm. got to go through to them. Because, again, if you're dealing with seven or eight teachers, yeah. and it's, the slightest, it's the same when you get a relief teacher in a primary school. Well, you know, the slightest little thing can throw them. Yeah, so um, true. Big impact. Yeah. The yeah. other thing that I found, in that transition from primary to secondary was just the shift into and in going to a timetable you know the minute you just said about executive function and working memory I know we actually had to have this is going to sound maybe a wee bit um, well not, not crazy but we did actually have a lot of practicing of at home around so at this time of the day you'll have to shift so we tried to kind of mimic that in a way during the day for um, you'd, okay, now you've got to go here because this piece of paper is telling you at this time you've got to be here. We just hadn't experienced anything like that. But That's right. what, I, actually, I kind of had to color code because my daughter couldn't read her timetable at all with the code mm -hmm. for what room it was, the code for the subject. She was unsure of what PDT stood for even, that it was project. Yeah. She didn't ever know what the subject was. So we color coded the folders that were in a locker to match the color on the timetable to try and really. Nice. And, it was, and then they've got the two weekly cycle. So week mm. one, is it week one or is it week two? And so we tried to color code that, you know, if it was if it was maths, that that maths was the blue folder and that on the timetable was blue and science was black. And the mm. folder, so when she got to a locker and even down to the locker, we had to buy a different lock for the mm. locker because the one that she had was too complex. So yeah. we just got a simple combination one with just three numbers, which she could work out and it was her birthday and you know those kind of things so it's really changing up and just thinking ahead of some of the things you can put in place to and I, and I think one of the biggest things there too for for potentially for parents that are listening is that at the end of the day we really do have to drive that yes. you know whether we like it or not we actually do need to drive that and I also want to add to that Sarah that you know there are so many children who don't have that support and so I think that's where for us the more we can spread the word or support others in our community to share those tidbits because not everybody thinks of those no and that's strategies. They, you know, my daughter still had a really challenging start to year seven and I'm a teacher and I know all of these things and it's still yeah. hard as a parent for, for her and you know throw COVID mm. in there as well and home learning and everything else but mm. you know and even the homework stats of you know the kids are going okay well they only have to finish the task they didn't get done in, in year seven that's not the homework expectation but for a child with dyslexia they that's every subject yeah you've got to catch up on so I mean we're doing a lot of pre-teaching I'm teaching her a lot of things in the weekend before the week to try and get her ahead of the game so things aren't a challenge and mm. you know, don't throw her um but yeah it's it's you know can't finishing off a task in a lesson well that could be seven classes that you've you're yeah right. yeah catch up like you know and, and they go home exhausted yeah and they've already put in 110 percent effort yeah so homework is a big one and I say getting that that technology that voice to speech is is a no-brainer for these kids because yeah and the audio books videos for the English top novels you know it's getting all those things in place so um, Google Read and Write is really big here in New Zealand, but over the lockdown, I spent quite a lot of time looking into Microsoft 365 yeah. and the Microsoft tools, and wow, oh my yeah. God, that just blew my mind. I'm really looking forward to when I've got a wee window that I can actually do a little bit more learning around that because they are far superior to... Yeah. Um, I don't know about New Zealand, but certainly in Australia, they're available to every student in every school, whether it's Catholic, independent, government, right. so New Zealand, but... Oh. Okay, that's cool. We need to look into that. Yeah, yeah certainly I can put you in touch with her. I'm sure yeah. you, we would happily do a chat with you. Um, I do I do have a connection with Troy, so I just need to yeah. actually find the window and follow it up. It's so helpful at coming out and showing you how to use them as well. And mm. so that, yeah, it's absolutely brilliant for those kids. I mean, I would, this is great, a couple of grade sixes I worked with today, and they, you know, they wrote five paragraphs since like half an hour by dictating it. Yeah, those nice. accommodations, Even in our standardised testing, those accommodations can be put in place as long as schools in Australia are using it already. You can't throw something in that plan that you need to scribe or voice to text if they've never used it before it's yeah got to be documented on their ILP and regular practice mm. to be able to you know and that would be the same with any kind of yeah yeah regular yeah practice is not going to get through with those accommodations mm. 
The next question is, what sorts of initiatives do you implement or have you implemented to educate your parents about what you're doing and why you're doing this? How do you get them on board? Yeah, are we well, when the preps come in, we do do an information session with Steve and myself talking to the prep parents um, because, again, we don't generally have parents coming to help with reading because mm. we need the most expert people to help those new readers new emerging readers you know in the past we would use the the old people's home nearby to come and help with those kids i would probably be less inclined to put those with struggling readers now i'd put those if i was having anyone to help with the kids who are quite fluent readers or to read to them in the library as opposed to hear them read um, because they need the people with the most skills and the most training in the learning support department they need highly skilled people so really with the parents we do that information session and we have fed bits in the newsletters and that kind of thing but really the kids spoke for themselves by going home and explaining rules and saying things oh I learned this today but the parents will be like oh wow that's you know and as the results have changed and they can see the progress in their kids the reputation's grown and they, they understand what they're what they're achieving you know I was looking at what my grade three was doing compared to you know some work that my niece in the UK might have been doing in year four or friends kids you know and he's been during remote learning studying storm boy through the writing revolution mm. And he's grade three and he's finds things hard, but you know, being able to to do really complex sentences based on the novel Storm Boy in grade three, you know, it's that kind of level of work. The parents see that in what they're achieving and certainly have with remote learning and watching yeah. what people are doing at home. We've had a lot of positive feedback in the way we delivered that and what mm. they can really see what the what the kids are achieving. So we haven't had to do that much education in that respect. Um, it's kind of the kids have done it for us. I think that uh, you know what we've um, observed over the lockdown too is exactly that with so the teachers who are on board and they have been zooming their students um, and teaching them through the screen and the parents have been there and been listening they just are going wow it's incredible to see and so that's been it, it has been a bit of a silver lining hasn't it yeah definitely yeah no it's been a lot of mm. positives out of it definitely so I mean some of those kids have had a real, real a big chunk of time to be really get to use their assistive technology and things so it's been great mm. what would you say are your go-to um favorite sort of evidence-based readings when you uh if you had a, a teacher who was new to Bentley West yep. and you were inducting them into the hall of Bentley West I was gonna say the hall of fame <laughs> <laughs> what would you what would be the sort of go-to in terms of science of reading um yeah, the edi book explicit direct instruction books are no-brainer um yeah. if you want those structures and systems and pedagogical stuff in place yeah i'll link that into the comment thread below for everybody yeah that, that's a no-brainer that definitely needs to be um to be one of them if you're wanting an early early knowledge of dyslexia i would say sally shaywitz Dyslexia. Overcoming dyslexia. Yeah, she just released the second edition, hasn't she? Yeah, that's a really yeah. good one, and it's a fairly easy read as well because there are mm -hmm. obviously some more complex ones. Um, there's a couple of really good articles I would probably recommend too. Is one is the working memory one. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that color, but I can send it through if not. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, and that's a really kind of a more, I guess, a basic read for for classroom teachers to understand the importance of taking into account working memory. Is we that the, um, it's not the guide, a working memory guide for yeah, classrooms? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah but it's really vitally important. because I can link that in because that's a free download yeah. PDF online too. Yep. Yeah, so I'll just make a note of that. Yeah. I think that's really worthwhile because we overload kids way too quickly um, and particularly kids with any kind of challenges. That working memory becomes overloaded extremely quickly. Yeah. So really, really important to know. Um, probably the, the other ones would be that we, I guess we've had a, a real ham on morphology and that's a bit of a love of mine. <laughs> I can see that your face lights up when you say that word. <laughs> There's not a great deal out there for morphology, but again, I've got some things that I can send through. Um, and also would be our probably our latest reading at the moment that we're trying to get all our teachers is the writing revolution and we yeah. help teachers do the training uh, even some crazy ones recently getting up at three in the morning doing it and then coming to work the next day oh wow far right. Right. That's that's commitment done. but um yeah really trying to put some of those strategies into really really ham up the writing at the moment as well so that's another really good one out there but if you're looking for that i guess that teacher knowledge and if you haven't you know if you if you can't access MSL OG training or the other really good one, I would say is letters training. And I don't mm. know if it's available in New Zealand now. No, it's not currently, but I'm, I'm thinking it'll only be a matter of time. Yeah, okay. To get yeah. Evans spelled in Australia and see if they can bring it across. across yeah. Because yeah, that letters training is fantastic. That does touch on the morphology. It does touch on the systematic synthetic phonics. It touches on all of it. Um, and again, written by Louisa Motes, who is... Mm. And, and, and it's so good, isn't it, to just be in and out of those things, because I think as you increase your knowledge, then you look through a different lens yourself as a learner. And that's what I experienced, you know, and I think probably some of the things that I've learned over the past five years in particular, I may have been privy to earlier, 
but as your knowledge increases you're ready to take that next step definitely yeah most definitely and there's so much there's so much out there when you start to unpick it and so much of it is available free as well there's so much yeah Article, so many articles that are out there you know there's and it's it's still worth looking back at things like the national reading panel and back from 2005 from australia the recommendations for that um mm. the five from five documentation so it's well worth looking back at those even though obviously there's there's been more recent things but you know it's well worth having a having a look back at what some of those national inquiries have have said and not been put in place mm. um the other one too uh i don't know if you had a chance to watch it but emily handford's presentation yeah. at Patton. oh my gosh yeah. I, that was that was just that's her best you know like I it was just outstanding wasn't it yeah, no, she's fantastic that's right yeah and I've had um when I did the letters training Carol Tolman and Mary Dalgren were the ones yes. that that also and obviously we've got a lot of work with Ron Yosemite and his morphology there's some mm. great great people out there and great research stuff that's been around from these guys mm, fantastic okay so a couple of other questions are um Oh, one is, do you allow voice to text in the classroom where well, you've already talked about yeah, that? Yeah, the only thing dictation. we do in a classroom situation, the noise can be more challenging. So it's you know, having that space for them to go and work where it is going to work more effectively because you're in mm -hmm. a classroom. But again, because sure. of the way they teach, I guess, and because of the volume in the classroom and the fact that classes are it's the way they're seated, they're not sitting in big groups clumped together making a lot of noise, it, it does work more effectively. But, you know, there will be students that will withdraw to work in a shared space where it's a bit quieter mm. because of the mm. building. We have put walls in as well to try and reduce noise. Nice. <laughs> what about the dyslexia font? The, the research shows it doesn't actually make a difference um, at the moment. The, what it does show is the area, it's all to do with the spacing and the sizing mm -hmm. as opposed to the font choice. Um, so that, that's what the research is showing that Arial can do the same job, but just spaced out and the sizing of the font. So that's more to look at. And I know Microsoft gives you that option too, to space it out and yeah, yeah. spread it out. Okay, I'm just scrolling through these. Um, yeah, and then we're just talking about other bits. So what about bilingual, any um, support for students who are either bilingual and or um, functioning in a bilingual unit in schools? Look, that would come into our, our learning enhancement. We don't call it learning support, we call it learning enhancement because uh, most of our children in support are actually at, at benchmark. And many of our students across the school are working 12 to 18 months ahead, but the learning enhancement actually caters for the extended kids as well. So we write a lot of ILPs and extended learning plans for those high, high achieving kids. And we also have a program for the students who have English as a second language. Um, so they would come into that, into that bulk of things. Because again, when you start working on things like morphology, it actually is working on vocab for these guys also. Mm, so it is a yes. slight, slightly different program, school program or tailored program for them, as opposed to a program we buy and fit them to. Mm. Um, but a lot of that vocab and morphology really expands their knowledge and then we can really tell whether it's ESL or whether there's more at play. Yeah, yeah, so true. And, and uh, you know, in the early stage of our journey here in New Zealand, that's very much what we're experiencing too in terms of uh, those schools. So we have some schools that have up to 29 different nationalities. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, there's a lot of children who have English as a second language. And again, we screen those guys. So even if they're, they're coming in in grade three or four or five or whatever, they join the school, we do those assessments before they start. So we know straight away what we're playing with or finding out, you know, various things from other assistants that have happened previously or contact mm. the school. So we, we know exactly what's at play so we can get in straight away because, you know, we don't want to wait for another year and go, oh, oh, look, they're struggling. We've wasted a whole year. Yeah, so true. <clears throat> So, so Sarah, thinking about, um, there's just one couple of other questions that I'd like to ask because people have um, sort of um, erred on this side of when they have teachers in their school or colleagues that they're speaking to yep. and they're wanting to help them to understand the evidence base behind the science of reading and what, what in your experience has worked really well or been effective and I know this is a massive question. Yeah, look, certainly, I guess a big thing we had at the beginning was, well, I can't do that with my class because I've got Bob and he's got attention and he's got this going on. And so what we found, certainly with things like the coaching model, is that we would go in and take their grade. Mm. So we would kids that we don't know particularly well or we do know them because they're at our school, but we'd go in and say, well, I'll take them. Then you can do them as opposed to going and watch someone teach and go, well, this is what's wrong. Mm. So we'll go in and say, well, I'll take them. I'll show you what they can do it because it's often, well, they can't do that. That's too hard for them. Oh, yeah. have you not do it? Or have you just not ever taught that high before? Because we had that with the maths when we started this approach. So we go, okay, the phonics is going really well. And they, oh, no, they can't do that in maths. That's way too high for them. <laughs> well, you said that about the phonics two years ago, and now look what they're doing. 
and he said that about the literacy and the spelling and so it's really I guess that coaching model is a, a lot more fluid like that so it will be that mm. the instructional leaders at our school now will go in I'm not doing so much of it now um we'll go in and and take those kids take the class show them then they can have their then they can watch the the teacher and vice versa and really do that and again it's it's reading that evidence and kind of simming through it and kind because of, they teachers just are time poor they they won't have time to look at it all and trying to pick yeah. out for them pick out the the best parts of it and over the years we had to say well I really want to do this program I've heard about this can we do it and we say well is there evidence where's the evidence to it and they'll go back to the people who've written it and ask them and they'll say oh no we don't have any peer-reviewed or oh well we're not going to trial it we don't we haven't got time to trial things with our kids at the moment um mm. we just don't have a year or two to trial something and work no it we just can't waste time on them so it's really I guess read 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 try and give them the evidence and again as leaders making sure that Steve and I are trying to keep on top of that as much as we can yeah the evidence that's out there yeah so Sarah there's a few really big things that I've picked up um, chatting with you this evening but one thing that I do really want to pick up is um is is your uh, emphasis on pedagogy over programs and the need to continuously for us to continuously upskill and to continuously increase our knowledge. And we can do that through um, reading if we're afforded the time, or we can do it through a coaching model in our schools, or we can do it through watching videos. I'm a very big fan of listening to podcasts yep. um, because that gets me outside away from my laptop because I'm a wee bit of a workaholic. So it <laughs> gets me outside um, walking and in the fresh air and I yeah I love that's how I love to learn is to listen to to various podcasts um and and the other things that have really resonated with me from what you've said this evening also are that it is really important for us to be really solid in our practice and the things that we're doing to be really sure about those before we take away the likes of running records if we've been historically using those as a measure um that's probably a really good lesson for myself yeah. as well um but probably one of the really big things for me is that you know this whole notion of trialing something mm -hmm. so I often read comments on various New Zealand education social media platforms or I have emails from teachers and they'll say we're just going to trial this mm -hmm. such and such and it, it is something that I like you think but these children you can, you have no right to trial something on these children no. and especially I mean, when it's that, you know, been one, around for one years. poor teacher and I'm not saying a poor teacher but a poor program <laughs> what the impact that will have on one student if you get two years of poor programs or another trialing teacher trialing a different program you know that can be detrimental for all kids but for kids with any kind of learning difficulties that, that's really harmful mm. So before we make any change, before we jump into anything, we need to be really, really sure that what we're doing is evidence-based, that it aligns with the science of reading, and, and that, it, that it really is um, going, to, going to, I'm going to say, influence teacher content knowledge, instructional practice, and then with quality school leadership on board, it's going to influence the education of that school community. Definitely. And I think Nancy Young is another one that does a really good infographic on that on the ladder of reading and shows the importance for, for all learners. And we've seen some of our top kids absolutely fly, like mm. the, the instruction they've had and how high they are because they're yeah. from the top. Um, but again, it's for those kids that are struggling. It's just, it, they don't have a choice. It's vital for them. Yes, mm. it's, it's enhancing everybody's learning but for those those ones who with any kind of difficulties and that's not just the, you know the five percent who are severely dyslexic that will be the you know the 20 to 40 percent of kids who are at that that end of the ladder um that nancy young's ladder is fabulous to explain that too yeah and and what's so super exciting is that she's next in my lineup for chit chat oh, Sarah. I didn't even yeah know. so <laughs> we didn't even mention that so yeah she is next month i think it's july the 15th i have a chit chat with nancy oh, awesome. she's so wonderful she was really prepared to drink yeah. coffee and eat chocolate and stay up to some ungodly hour so that she could um so that she could help spread yeah, the good awesome. word here in New Zealand yeah so um thank you so much for your time this evening Sarah we could sit here clearly and talk um until the the wee hours but you have a family to get back to so thank you I'll so much have a look at the questions later and see if there's any yeah as well. that, that would be great and thank you so much for your generosity and willingness to share and um 
And we do hope that, you know, it may not be this year that we get that wonderful, wonderfully committed group of New Zealand um, uh, t teachers and leaders to visit you guys at Bentley West. But if it's not later this year, we certainly look forward to coming and seeing you in action next year. Sounds good. Thanks so much, Sarah. Thanks, Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.